Welcome back. We'll be starting session three this afternoon, liver biopsy, new techniques for interpretation of histopathology. My name is George McCarr, the acting deputy director of the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition, and I will be co-moderator for this session. We'll begin the session with three excellent presentations followed by a discussion panel. And for the sake of allowing for an uninterrupted flow of presentations, I'll introduce all three presenters at this time. In the first presentation, Dr. Zachary Goodman will discuss alternative methods for histologic assessment. Dr. Goodman is currently the Director of Liver Pathology Research at Inova Fairfax Hospital. He attended Vanderbilt University, enrolling in the Joint MD-PhD program with PhD work in experimental pathology, followed by internship in pathology residency at Johns Hopkins. And since residency, he has specialized in liver pathology, first at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, and since 2010 at INOVA, where he has continued his work in diagnostic liver pathology and teaching, including directing and participating in dozens of CME courses. He's also participated in research in nearly all areas of liver disease, including serving as a central pathologist for dozens of multicenter clinical trials of new forms of therapy for liver disease, including numerous trials for treatment of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and one trial for hepatitis D, as well as numerous trials for NAFLD, NASH, and two trials for PSC. He has authored or co-authored over 260 peer-reviewed papers and over 50 book chapters and invited reviews and abstracts. Next, Dr. Nicholas Petrick will discuss understanding artificial intelligence, promises, challenges, and opportunities. Dr. Petrick received his PhD from the University of Michigan in electrical engineering systems, focusing on medical signal and image processing. Dr. Petrick is currently Deputy Director for the Division of Imaging, Diagnostics, and Software Reliability in the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health at the US FDA. He is also a member of the FDA's Senior Biomedical Research and Biomedical Product Assessment Services. Dr. Petrick's research is focused on developing robust medical AI machine learning, least burdensome assessment methods for a wide range of medical imaging-based AI, ML devices, and quantitative imaging biomarkers. And finally, Dr. Cynthia Guy will discuss the strengths and limitations of artificial intelligence or machine learning liver histology reading methods. Dr. Guy is a GI and liver pathologist with more than 20 years of clinical diagnostic experience. She's active in many areas of translational research and has a special interest in NAFLD NASH. She is a longstanding member of the NASH CRN Pathology Committee and a member of the International NAFLD Pathology Group. She received her MD degree from the Medical University of South Carolina, completed anatomic and clinical pathology residency at Emory University, and was fellowship trained at Duke. Thank you. We will now begin with our first presentation with Dr. Goodman. Yes, thank you, George. Um, well, I was asked to speak about uh, alternative methods for histologic uh, assessment and with liver biopsies. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So I thought about things I might uh, want to touch on. Uh, there's uh, lessons from the viral hepatitis trials that uh, we I've worked on for a long time. We don't really have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of what we do will do with NASH is the same sort of thing that we did with viral hepatitis. And I could also talk about the uh, proposed NASH grading and staging systems that are available about um, minimizing variability in reading of uh, slides and um, and uh, how how this data could be uh, best used. Uh, next next slide, please. So um, I have a long experience with this. I've been working on clinical trials for over thirty years. I counted up a couple of years ago when I've had, uh, been the central pathologist for uh, seventy. Uh, clinical trials as of that time for viral hepatitis and NASH mostly. And um, in, in the, the course of that, I've uh, read and evaluated over 60,000 biopsies. It's been, you know, not, not all at once, but over the course of uh, three decades. And I've had, uh, there have been seven drugs that have received FDA approval based on my reading of the drugs, of, of the slides. Uh, all of them from viral hepatitis, for four, dr four uh, drugs for uh, treatment of hepatitis B and three, dr three drug combinations for hepatitis C. For hepatitis B, the liver biopsy improvement was the primary endpoint. For hepatitis C, it was a key secondary endpoint. 
Next slide, please. So I, I can speak from a lot of experience and what and um, what we started doing and uh, when uh, the clinical trials started being done for uh, viral hepatitis, there was already a method for assessing the liver biopsies that had been published some years before. Um, and the uh, banner here is from the uh, volume one of hepatology. There was an uh, article published with the first author, uh, Bob Nodell, who's a clinician. And the second author is Kamal Ishak, who uh, was my mentor and um, and and I, my late my late colleague, uh, Kamal Ishak, who I worked with for many years. He was, he was the pathologist who came up with this method for assessing liver biopsies uh, in, 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 in chronic hepatitis. And what he did was he uh, separated the uh, components of the injury into the different uh, areas in the, within the liver lobule. And each one of these was graded on a scale of uh, mostly from zero to four. And then you would add up the, um, the uh, points that you got for these uh, stages. And, and each of these was a, a, not really a quantitative amount, but a category, a category that, uh, for, for the increasing severity. So uh, you add them up and the uh, overall grade of injury or the grade of activity or the activity score uh, could range from zero to 18, which is a nice range for showing uh, both improvement and worsening. Uh, for the uh, stage of disease was the amount of fibrosis, and in the original score, it was it could be from zero to four, just like in NASH. Um, and uh, when trials started being done in hepatitis B and hepatitis C, this was available, so it was used as a way of assessing the liver biopsies, which were either a primary or a key secondary endpoint. Um, and when, when when the trial started, uh, there was um, no, you know, there's really no molecular biology. The hepatitis C uh, virus had yet to be identified, and things were very primitive. So the liver biopsy was the best there was. Uh, for the hepatitis B, the original proposal, there, there was a way to uh, assess hepatitis B DNA that could be measured in blood, but although not the uh, uh, with not as much refinement as now. And it um, the um, sponsors wanted to use that as the primary endpoint. And the FDA said, no, uh, that, that is an untested, uh, an unproven surrogate. Uh, you'll need to do something that's a little bit closer to the clinical outcome. And they recommended uh, looking at the liver biopsies. So there's some controversy about that, but that was what was done. And um, the uh, criterion for uh, for uh, a successful improvement in liver biopsy was not uh, the uh, total uh, uh, histologic activity index activity score, because uh, that, that's really um, a discontinuous categorical score. Um, and uh, what was recommended was that uh, a, a, a the amount of improvement would be uh, w that was required for some sort of clinical benefit should be uh, assessed and made it. And uh, in this case, it was a two-point improvement in the inflammation and the uh, histologic activity score activity and the activity components. So if you had a two-point or more improvement, you were considered a responder and less than that, or if it got worse, you were considered a non-responder. And it turned out that actually worked pretty well. For the uh, stage, uh, it was not a, a, a expected that uh, that would improve at all because nobody thought fibrosis could really regress. Now, uh, when the study started being done, it was around 1990, so this was used then. And in a few years, there was some uh, dissatisfaction with the score, so uh, some uh, refinements were made, and uh, this time, uh, Ishak was the first author on the paper, and so that's called the Ishak score. It's very similar to the original Nodell score, which was what was mostly used in the hepatitis trials. But uh, it does have one uh, added refinement, and that is there are six uh, stages of fibrosis plus normal, which would be zero. So actually seven stages of 
of uh, fibrosis that could be used, which gives you more granularity and a better ability to see uh, changes in fibrosis. Uh, next slide, please. So um, lessons learned from the viral hepatitis studies. Uh, the, uh, one, one lesson was that it was uh, the, the enrollment in the studies was not uh, based on histology. It was based on the uh, serology by the presence of the virus in the blood, by measuring the viral load when that became available, and by the ALT. So there were no screening biopsies, and that uh, takes away a big area of controversy of uh, a potential um, uh, uh, in. in 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 instability in the uh, in the uh, final reading. So what would happen was that the patients would have a baseline biopsy. They would be treated for a prescribed period of time, and then have an end of treatment biopsy. Which and the and the the two biopsies were assessed together, without the pathologist knowing which was pretreatment and which was post treatment. And if there was a two point improvement, then it was considered a, a patient was considered a responder. And, and uh, there, there was a lot of investigation into this. It was it was shown within a, a short time that this, these were not really these categorical scores were not really uh, highly reproducible. And if you scored too low to start with, that didn't give you enough room for improvement for a two point improvement. So some pathologists tend to score lower than others. They're, they they were not very successful at using this method. Those of us who were tended to score higher. Did a, had a better job because that gave us more room for improvement. Um, it, um, what, what, another thing that I found that was helpful in doing this was that in borderline cases, you round up. If you say it's on the border between a three and a four, you round up to the four. And that again, gives you more room for improvement. And then the other thing that, uh, since it's not very reproducible, it's not well, not highly reproducible. The Kappa scores are in the uh, moderate to uh, to to, to uh, significant range, but uh, it's not a perfect uh, system. So if you if you do it a second time, it won't come out exactly the same. So it was a good idea not to compete with yourself. It doesn't do any good to have two sets of scores that aren't exactly the same. So you have the baseline biopsies and the end of treatment biopsies, and you could compare them and then use them all as a statistical sample rather than as an absolute value. So, and uh, what we found was that when the drugs worked as they really did for the nucleoside analogs and for the interferon-based treatment when there was sustained virologic response, when the drugs really worked, and then it, any way that you assess the biopsy worked, everything would, would go in the same direction, which was something that we heard about in the earlier sessions today. It helps when everything seems to be giving you the same result. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, another thing was about uh, that, that's come up in recent years is uh, how many pathologists does it take to assess the a, a slide? Uh, and in of, of those 70 uh, clinical trials that I worked on, I was the only pathologist for 66 of them. So one will work if, you, if you've got a drug that works and everything is going in the same direction. It's not really that hard. And uh, that, that's pretty much what I prefer. It, 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 if you have to do more manipulation, you're just going to have uh, more chances for uh, competing with yourself or, or having disagreements. But you can you can do it other ways. Uh, two pathologists working together is a good way to do it. You sit together over a double-headed scope and discuss it as you're looking at the slides. And pretty much, uh, I've, I've never had an example where I couldn't come to agreement with the other pathologist uh, very, very quickly. And it turns out that that's actually more efficient than doing it one, one at a time, one by yourself. Uh, that the, uh, the scores tend to be more reproducible and it goes faster. Now you can also use two pathologists reading the slides independently of one another, and then they have to get together and, and resolve their differences. And there's always going to be differences because these are categories and there's always borderline cases. And then, you know, some, some pathologists say uh, they, have somebody they work with and they have no trouble at all coming to consensus. 
I always worry about the alpha pathologist being the one who is uh, uh, who's actually doing the reading. That uh, it's either the most senior or the most aggressive or the most uh, you know prestigious, whatever. Um, and um, there's some uh, studies now that are using three pathologists, you know, two to read the slides and then one to be the tiebreaker, or you take two out of three. If they read the same thing, you call that uh, the cons uh, consensus read. And I've actually done this with as many as 12 in the, in the HALT-C trial. We had 12 different pathologists. We would sit around a 12-headed microscope and look at everything together and come to consensus. That, that worked most of the time. Um, there's another way you can do it, which uh, hasn't been done very often, but which I think is a good way to do it. And that was one of the very first trials I ever read was the uh, lamivudine trial for treatment of hepatitis B. Back in those days, this was 19, the early 1990s, uh, there were no international studies. They were there, so, uh, the, uh, but, so there were, there were actually three trials that were used by uh, the, the sponsor to uh, uh, have the data to have, uh, show the results of the phase two. Um, there was a North American study for which I was the only reader. There was an Asian study for which uh, Professor P.C. Wu in Hong Kong was the only reader. And uh, they, these were different patients, but the studies had an identical protocol and the patients were recruited in the same way and they were treated the same way. And it turned out we got identical results. Professor Wu and I were reading them totally different patients, totally independently. Each of us found that about 50% of the patients on the active drug had a, were, were responders, had at least a two-point improvement, and 25% of the placebo-treated patients also had an improvement, but it was twice as many in the treated group. And it was highly statistically significant. And uh, on that basis, the drug was approved and is still, I believe, being used. Um, now, um, this hasn't been used very much, but I've recommended it to a number of people. And uh, the uh, the uh, resmeteron res trial, which is going to be presented to the FDA pretty soon, uh, you know, they, the NDA is in the process of being evaluated. Uh, that's what they did in their trial, as I understand it, and they had a, a similar success that both pathologists came to the same conclusion. So I think that's a good way to do it as well. I would, my, my first recommendation would be to have one, unless you have a reason for, uh, uh, overriding reason, or have two reading them together, or have two reading the entire study separately. Anything else, I think, is just uh, more work than it's worth. Okay, next, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, th this is the results from uh, one of the uh, hepatitis B trials, Adepavir, for treatment of hepatitis B in the e antigen positive study uh, patients. And um, now the, the criterion for calling the patient a responder, according to the, the protocol, was a two-point improvement in the inflammatory components of the original adult score. Um, so you read the the the, the and but what but the the pathologist is blinded as to uh, the order of the biopsies and to what treatment the patient the the, the patients are on. So uh, and if you look at the results, it uh, it doesn't matter how you cut the data. If you uh, look at the mean HII score uh, for adafavir, it's uh, about uh, improvement by about two point five uh, HAI units. For placebo patients, treated patients, 30% of them uh, had a two-point improvement, but 30%, another 30% had a two-point worsening. So the mean score is, is uh, almost zero. But if you look at the two-point improvement, which is the primary endpoint, it was twice as much in the uh, pa patients on, um, on the active drug, either using the Nodel, original Nodel, or the ISHAC modification. Uh, twice as many had uh, a response. Uh, another uh, way that was uh, suggested was looking at a 50% uh, improvement in the H HAI. Again, there was a big difference between the placebo-treated patients and the adepavir-treated patients. You could use a metavir score, which has a more limited range, and uh, use a one-point improvement as a criterion. 
and it comes out about the same. Or you could use well, one way that I like is uh, sort of the, the equivalent of Nash resolution would be almost normal uh, in, in, in hepatitis resolution that, so that the, there's very little inflammation. And uh, there again, it's 46% uh, as opposed to 48% uh, as opposed to 10% among the placebo treated patients. So, any way that you cut the data, it's highly statistically significant, P less than. 0. 0.0001. And the reason is because the drug really works. And uh, that was true for all the other hepatitis B uh, nucleoside and nucleotide analogs. And it was true for hepatitis C patients who had a sustained virologic response. Next slide, please. And uh, you know you don't even have to use the numbers. You can put the slides side by side. On, and here's a, from uh, one of the hepatitis C trials. The baseline biopsy is on the left, and the uh, the biopsy taken six months after the end of treatment is on the right. The patient had a sustained virologic response, and there's a lot of inflammation in the baseline biopsy, the little black dots that you can see on the, the lymphocytes. And in the post-treatment biopsy, there's almost no inflammation. The, the portal area, which had had the inflammation before, looks pretty bare. And next slide, please. Next, and uh, so that's inflammation. But uh, uh, no, go. I'm sorry. Go back. Yeah, you, you see the same thing with fibrosis. The fibrosis improves too. It's usually not as dramatic as this one. This was a hepatitis B patient who was uh, biopsied at baseline, and then it, after 48 weeks of treatment, most of the long-term studies are after five years of treatment. But some of the patients have a really miraculously miraculous improvement in uh, fibrosis as well. Uh, I suppose it's something to do with the individual variability of, uh, of, uh, of the patients. Okay, so that's that's viral hepatitis. That's the lessons learned. Uh, next slide. What about, so what about NASH? Okay, so uh, there are a lot of uh, methods that have been proposed for NASH. They were proposed even before there were NASH trials that were uh, starting. And then after NASH trials started in the... Uh, uh, even more were proposed. Uh, the original score by uh, Elizabeth Brunt was uh, a simple score for uh, saying how severe the disease was. So three, three grades, mild, moderate, marked, or grades one, two, and three, and then four stages, which is what's pretty much been uh, maintained, uh, uh, the same four stages that are in the NASH CRN and in a number of other uh, systems. There, there is, you know, the, the biggest problem is that the stages are not units. And in fact, the grades are not units either. So uh, the difference between one and two is not the same as the difference between two and three, three and four. And, and, and stage four is cirrhosis, so which covers a huge range. You know, very advanced cirrhosis and there's very early cirrhosis. So in the session this morning, when they talked about a one stage improvement, I mean, you don't you don't start out at the in the middle of the stage. You could be anywhere in the stage. You could be just right on the borderline between stage three and stage four. Some of those patients just rebiopsing them, you'll get the other stage. So, which is at least the the, the source of some of the so-called placebo effect. Uh, there are other uh, ways of staging it with the uh, ishac type uh, stages with six uh, stages of, of, of fibrosis or seven if you include the uh, normal stage zero. And uh, just recently um, in 2022, I believe, this last year, there was a, a paper published in hepatology by a fairly large group, which included uh, uh, first author was uh, Rish Pai, along with uh, a couple of other, um, uh, several other pathologists, including David Kleiner and, uh, and uh, Cindy Bailing were also on the paper, but they had four pathologists who uh, read this read the study. They had uh, forty biopsies that they that they um, had digitized. They were good biopsies, so it's set up to be a a, a good study. And they developed a, an expanded uh, NAS score, where instead of having only four grade four grade, I'm sorry, eight eight eight-point scale for the uh, for the in inflammation. 
they had a, an 11 point scale and six stages of uh, fibrosis and they had a, um, a wider range so they had better uh, room for improvement and then also had very high reproducibility so that one hasn't actually been used in a clinical trial, but I think it would deserve at least to be tested as a as an exploratory uh, way of evaluating the biopsies. Um, but none of none of that is what the FDA uh, is is actually asks uh, us to do. The the the, the, the criteria for uh, accelerated improvement for an endpoint is what we've heard about Nash resolution, which uh, I'm not sure it ever really resolves or improvement by one stage in the fibrosis uh, score, the, in, in the four-point uh, fibrosis score. So uh, next slide, please. Well, anyway, I know that it, uh, that that um, Nash resolution does happen sometimes because I've seen it in some of the trials. The, the, it may be a placebo effect, or it may be that the, something's happened with the patient, or else there was uh, perhaps it's... Uh, a variant, a variant of NASH that's more susceptible to that type of treatment. And uh, as, as Scott uh, Friedman said during his uh, presentation or in, in the panel, that uh, that there may be m multiple kinds of NASH and some will respond to one form of treatment and uh, more than the others. But this one uh, had severe NASH on the on at baseline on the on the left, and then essentially normal liver on the right so it does happen uh, and i don't know what the patient uh, anything about the patient since i was blinded except uh, it's pretty obvious that the baseline must be the one on the left if the one on the right had been the baseline the patient would have not been uh, enrolled in the study next slide please so uh this is my last slide and um you know what 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 is the things that we can uh, think about for um, other ways of doing it? Uh, is, if, if, so uh, one thing to keep in mind is when the drugs work, if you have a really effective drug, then almost anything that you do, including just putting the slides side by side, will work. You can tell that the that the there was uh, histologic improvement. Unfortunately, uh, so far all of the drugs that have been through the trials have not been either been totally ineffective or only marginally effective, that they may have some subtle changes that can be uh, detected with uh, uh, non-invasive tests or with using uh, artificial intelligence, but that I don't think is going to uh, result in uh, enough clinical benefit for the patients to actually improve their the way they uh, feel, function, or survive, particularly survive. So, uh, you know, what can you do? Well, one the good thing to do would be to have more effective drugs. Uh, you know, if the drugs were better, then we wouldn't have to worry about looking so hard for finding ways to show that they're better. Um, or we could try alternative methods. There's the uh, expanded uh, NAS, which I mentioned. There's um, which has a wider range. There are the AI systems, which have, um, we'll be hearing more about in the rest of this, uh, this session. Uh, but there, there are other things that you could, that, that don't really require uh, artificial intelligence. They just require the right software. I've been, for the past uh, oh, almost 20 years, ever since we started doing studies on fibrosis, uh, I've been using, um, and my, my lab has been using uh, computer-assisted morphometry to quantify the amount of fibrosis that's there. And the software keeps improving. Uh, you can buy commercial software that's very good at quantifying how much fibrosis is there, how much uh, uh, fat is there, and other tissue components. And Or you can have the uh, companies that are specializing in it do the work for you. Um, and um, so uh, with the measuring collagen, the CPA is uh, called the collagen proportionate area. That's uh, something that we've been doing using serious red stain sections. Uh, Dr. Guy and I both have done some work using sonic hedgehog to identify balloon cells. I was hopeful that maybe that could also be a good way to quantify it. And uh, I was 
kind of disappointed in our results because it, there you could see some cells that were clearly balloon but that were negative for the, the hedgehog uh, ligand. Uh, but um, we're, we're hopeful that we'll still come up with something that can be help that can be good at quantifying it. So um, I think that, that's my last slide. Next, uh, and I will uh, stop there and turn it over to uh, Dr. Patrick for the next uh, presentation. Great, thank you. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit and try to give a really brief un an introduction to understanding artificial intelligence, the promises, challenges, and opportunities. Next slide. So just a disclaimer about commercial products. Next slide. So medical AI ML provides an opportunity to improve diagnostic accuracy, streamline clinical workflows, improve quality, personalize healthcare, and potentially solve a large number of other healthcare issues. So I want to try to give you a context. I'll talk a bit about pathology and NASH specifically, but also try to give you a wider context of what's happening in the field. Next slide. So just to get an idea of what the expected gross rate is, um, in this year, it's about a $20 billion industry. It's expected to grow to $187 billion industry in medical and healthcare AI ML. So that's a 37% year by year growth expected. So I think not the question isn't whether we're going to see more AI in medical practice or healthcare. It definitely will be there. I think the question is to be to what extent and what areas and how is it going to be integrated into the system? Next slide. So just to give you sort of an idea of the NASH AI ML landscape, this is from Danani from 2021. Um, and looking at various types of data and how that's been integrated for NASH. So in electronic me medical health records, there's NASH phenotype signatures to flag at-risk individuals. There's been a lot of work in radiological imaging and MR, ultrasound, CT, looking at things like liver stiffness, fibrosis staging, and many other um, factors. In histology, things like NAS CRN scoring and other types of assessment and, and quantitative evaluation of, of pathology and histology slides as well. Now, just to give you an overview on the right hand side, it's sort of a structure to NASH um, AIML, looking at artificial intelligence as the umbrella. Um, it's broken down, Danani breaks this down into traditional ML, which incorporates two aspects. One is identifying features or engineering features, and then the classifier that's applied to those features based and using the data to train that classifier or deep learning approaches. Now, deep learning typically, but does, it doesn't have to be this way, but a lot of times it integrates um, both the feature identification with the classification stage. So it's a little bit of a more straight line process from data as input, the AI then determines the features and the classifier, and you get an output from that stage. So it's it's a lot more um, less more more straightforward to um, take a particular deep learning structure and apply it across a wide range of potential application areas. Um, where the traditional method requires that feature engineering stage, which could be a, a, a hang up. There are also two different ways of applying machine learning, um, supervised and unsupervised. And this applies for both traditional methods as well as deep learning methods. Um, supervised learning, you have both the image data as well as the reference or the, the um, um, truth associated with that data. And you can use that in the training process and do a, a more efficient training process. Unsupervised approaches, you don't have the label or the the reference information for the data, but what you're trying to do is group that data into different um, subgroups, and those groups have particular features or, or factors associated with them, and you try to associate those in an unsupervised way. So both of these are viable. Most of AI ML um, to date uses supervised methods because it's much more straightforward to apply um, across medical imaging, but also across commercial AI ML as well. But unsupervised methods are growing, and ways of improving or improving the ability to acquire Reference standard data is also a real big um, um, push. Next step, uh, next slide. So I just wanted to give you sort of an overview of the supervised AML development process. Um, it's important, especially related to NASH in this particular case. So the input to these would be things like WSI images or regions or information. Um, what's important to note in the training data that you have truth labels to this data. So there's some label, in this case, it may be a NASH score of some sort um, or NASH stage um, for this particular data set. The, um, the generalizability of this data set. So how robust is a data set relative? Does it come from multiple sites? Does it have multiple um, you know, prepping and everything uh, associated with that data is really important. So the generalizability, the robustness of that data really is gonna define the robustness of the classifier. So that data is input to our overall classifier. 
it produces some type of Nash score. And then we have a function that we're trying to minimize the loss between the truth, in this case, the truth labels and the output. So we want those truth labels, those Nash scores, to match our truth labels on our data. And we want to do that in aggregate across the entire data set. And so there is a process, a loss function, and a, a in a minimum optimization approach to try to minimize the difference between the truth labels and the Nash score. So that process is iterative. This will go around and around until we come up with something we consider to be a uh, reasonable solution to the problem. Um, once we have that, next slide, please. This is implemented in a validation process. So again, um, pretty straightforward, but it's really important that these WSI images be independent, ideally from different sites, and be, be, be really representative of the, of the use population that's going to be utilized. So again, we have those WSI images. Those are um, processed through the AI system that produces NASH scores, and we do some sort of assessment of the performance. So comparing or correlating the truth labels with the output of those cases. In the cases where we have a robust data set and we have good performance or what we consider good performance, he may, may me thinks, next slide, please, to move forward on to sort of a different um, clinic or to potentially integrate into a clinical context or a clinical trial context, at least to move forward. So next step, please. Uh, next, next slide. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how AIML is being integrated. And it's not just in the, we always often think of it as just this inter, inter, interpretation aid where it's used just to make clinical decisions or to support the clinician. But it's really can be used in the image acquisition process. Can we optimize the image acquisition? It can be used in what we call the post-processing um, uh, phase where in the case of maybe pathology, things like color normalization, is it useful to normalize these images after acquisition if they're done by different devices? Or if we have different WSIs with different different scanning properties, can we normalize that data to improve the image interpretation or improve the you know future AI that's going to be applied to it? Clearly, it can be applied in the image interpretation process to both support clinicians and potentially as automated um, uh, analysis tools. Another area that people may not appreciate is it really can be quite functional in the reporting process to both improve the quality of the report as well as improve um, the amount, the information content in that report, more consistent, um, more um, stable uh, information content. So again, especially around imaging, it's really important to think about AI ML associated with each of these different aspects in the chain. Next slide, please. So where's the promise of AI ML in pathology? Well, currently still a lot of pathology is glass slides read with optical microscopes. We know we're in a transition phase where we're moving more towards digital pathology where slides are scanned and, and the pathologist can interpret using displays on a display um, system. What the real promise for, um, especially around AI, AIML, is AI-powered digital pathology, where not only are the pathologist reading in digital space, but the AI is used to optimize the acquisitions, to optimize the processing, to optimize the information content applied to the uh, uh, given to the pathologist during the interpretation process, and potentially to op optimize the reporting structure as well. And in this case, the goal is to integrate that into a system that hopefully is a more efficient, um, but hopefully also provides um, as good or better diagnostic information overall. Next slide, please. Um, just to show you sort of generally where AIML is in medical applications, I just gave you two examples here um, that are somewhat mature in the sense that there are a number of devices in these various areas. Um, in mammography, this is an example from Van Winkle um, where they looked at how well does AI perform compared to radiologists reading, in this case, ditto breast tomosynthesis data. And what they found is that the AIML rivaled the reader performance in this case. And you can see here the blue dots are the reader performance. The um, Purple curve is the AIML um, ROC curve, and you can see it pretty much splits between the readers. So it's somewhere in the middle of an average reader um, for this particular example. And we're seeing that more and more with application areas where the AI is being consistent with readers in, re re um, um, in interpretation text tasks. Another example, this is an FDA pivotal study assessing an autonomous diabetic retinopathy AIML. And I just wanted to give you this data to give you an idea where this um, this pivotal study data fell as far as sensitivity of around 87% and specificity about 90 or 91% for diabetic retinopathy assessment. In this case, this is an autonomous AIML device. Um, and we'll I'll get back to this later when I talk about generalizability in a little bit. Next slide, please. So some challenges around AIML. Well, there's a huge challenges about data, it's things like governance. So how do we acquire data? How do we aggregate data together? Where should it be stored? How do we deal with security issues around data and so forth? 
There's a lot of um, challenges, especially in the medical area, around large representative data sets, how to acquire those. Even though there might be lots of imaging data, we may not have labeled data, we may not have patient or other types of information that are readily available with those data sets, which make them less um, functional. There are clearly issues around the quality of the reference data, and especially dealing with things like uh, pathologist variability in their determinations or assessments of the data, especially when we get the more quantitative measurements as well. Um, there are regulatory science and assessment um, challenges around, again, lack of data sets, a lack of standardized data sets, and lack of assessment tools and methods, especially for very um, specialized um, pathology tests. Those still are in the process of being developed and, 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 and consensus built on them. Um, clearly, there are algorithm robustness issues. So uh, addressing things like algorithmic bias and then the fairness, how fair is the algorithm across the population of patients it's going to be applied to? Some things that people don't consider as much are sort of the consistency in the range of real world settings. We can have a lot of different real world settings in pathology, and AIML might, might perform quite well in one setting, but not quite as well in other settings. And the same thing happens over time. Clinical practice can change over time, where the data input to the AI might change over time, and therefore the AI performance may vary as well. And so having ways of actively monitoring and dealing with those types of issues is really an important aspect of the robustness. Another, I think, underappreciated area is understanding the upstream and downstream role or impact of AIML in the clinical workflows. Again, really important considerations. You can have high-quality AIML that doesn't fit within the workflow and therefore isn't used um, effectively or isn't used at all in some of these situations. So thinking through those problems early in the process is really important. Next slide. So some challenges around the regulatory science gaps, and these are some gaps that we've identified from our group, um, but they clearly aren't all the gaps in AI and pathology AI ML, but things around like the technical performance assessment of the WSI system. So again, there's a lack of standardized test methods, and there's suboptimal interoperability between the various systems. In pathology AI ML, again, a lack of standardized test sets, a lack of report, um, st reporting standards for complex AI ML pipelines and assessment methods, and a lack, of general, a lack of generalizability across the scanners and the clinical sites. So some of the work in my group that we're looking at is, is trying to develop st standardized pathology viewer, viewer testing tools, again, to have a standardized approach that all the vendors and all the developers can utilize in order to compare and contrast their um, pathology viewers. Working on trying to figure out best methods and practices for truthing pathology data, how to deal with the reader variability, the pathology re pathologist variability issues, when acquiring AI ML data, either for training and, and for testing. Trying to develop an AI ML checklist for digital pathology um, to look at factors to consider and include when assessing or, or implementing an AI ML um, for pathology. And then clearly we have work around assessment tools and trying to develop methods for things like segmentation and AI-based ba AI biomarker scoring. Um, we're also looking at other factors like um, in the post-processing space around things like color normalization tools. How can we quantify the performance of these tools? How can we look at their impact on, on AI ML performance? Next slide, please. I wanted to look at challenges around generalizability, and we'll go back to that diabetic retinopathy example. This is a performance of seven digital diabetic retinopathy AI devices used in clinical practice around the world. And this was assessed on about more than 300,000 images from 20, more than 23,000 um, veterans. Um, and we can look at the performance on the upper right, and we see sensitivity and specificity for the various algorithms, where the gray here is human performance. And we can see a pretty wide range in sensitivity for the various algorithms, and usually with a trade-off in specificity. So the algorithms that had lower sensitivity tended to have a bit higher specificity performance. But you can see of these seven algorithms, they're all operating at different points, uh, um, individual operating points. So we have different performances. So if you're going to interchange these algorithms, you have to understand what the trade-offs are in their performance. What I also thought was, thought was interesting here was looking at subgroups. In this case, the bottom plot is moderate um, diabetic retinopathy or worse, which is the, the class of patients that we really want to find. And we see, again, a variation in performance where some of the algorithms that may not have performed quite as well um, in the overall performance actually perform better on this subgroup. But we see all of these algorithms are actually slightly behind the performance of the human reader in this case. So again, not just looking and concentrating on the aggregate performance on the overall population, but also identifying which parts of the sub, which subgroups or subpopulations are important to assess and understand performances is really a critical factor to understand generalizability. Next slide, please. 
Um, another just example is the challenges around truth variability. This is an example of ballooning hepatocyte identification. There were 10 WSA slides evaluated by nine internationally recognized liver, expert liver pathologists. And their goal was to mark every balloon hepatocyte. And you can look at the plot on the right, and we'll, the x-axis is the slide number, and the y-axis is the counts with the individual dots being the various pathologists. You can see for slide one, there's fairly good agreement among those pathologists about the number of, of ballooning hepatocytes. But if you look at slide slide, you see a large variability ranging from less than 50 to more than 200 um, is a large variation. And we see a relatively modest variation across all of these sites. So if you're trying to count the number of ballooning hepatocytes, there's a lot of reader variability. What was also interesting, if you're really interested in the individual slides, cells that are ballooning, only one cell was considered ballooned by all, all nine pathologists in this particular study. So you had thousands of cells that were identified, and many times there's a lot of variability between those individual cells. So if we're looking at identifying individual cells, variability is even going to be larger. Now, clearly, the variability is a function of the particular task, and some tasks will have more variability. Others tasks will have less. Next slide, please. And just some opportunities around it. One is to develop large data sets. And one could be an image data set for, um, for NASH or other pathology application areas. I wasn't able to find a NASH data set, but there are um, publicly available data sets for spe specimen and gene data sets. Um, there are other areas where there are large archives of images, things like the cancer imaging archive for cancer images associated with many different modalities. And then just another one I wanted to highlight is the Medical Imaging and Data Resource Center, MIDRIC effort, which is collecting large data sets of um, uh, COVID-19 data, but what they did was interesting is they actually sequestered a portion of their data set to be used for independent assessment of AI algorithms. So thinking through how to develop large data sets for pathology and how to utilize that data effectively to improve the ability to compare and contrast algorithms is important. Next slide. Um, again, other other opportunities include um, new AI mode development opportunities around assessing architectural elements, cells, nuclei, and his, other histologic features, counting and quantifying, reducing reader variability for specific interpretation tasks, diagnostic aids, and then many other areas around assessment, um, uh, uh, acquisition, um, post-processing, and report generation, among others. Last slide. And just in summary, we'll, we, we will see a rise in the number of medical AI ML tools available moving forward. There are plenty of opportunities to improve digital pathology and specifically NASH characterization, assessment, and monitoring. But challenges remain about around AI ML robustness, data availability, truth variability, assessment method development, and implementation within the clinical workflow, especially for the relatively new area of digital pathology analysis. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it over um, to Dr. Guy. Okay, um, thank you for that talk. Um, so good afternoon to everyone. Um, could I have my first slide, which is the second one, next one. Um, so thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this important workshop. My assigned topic is strengths and weaknesses of using artificial intelligence and machine learning in MASH liver biopsy scoring for clinical trials. Next slide. Um, my disclosures, um, I have worked actively in the NASH clinical trial space for, for quite a time, quite a long time, not as long as Zach, but um, mainly in the NASH CRN, but also I, I am a consultant for the various biopharmaceutical entities listed here. Next slide. Further disclosures, or maybe this is a little bit more like a confession, is that I am not a computational pathologist. I don't really like computers and I don't understand them. Next slide. However, we are all already surrounded and immersed in AI machine learning based tools in our daily lives. And we use them, but we may not understand the functionality of them in great detail. Next slide. Even as physicians, we often use and rely on tools that we may not have a detailed intrinsic knowledge of how they work. So although many of us on this, uh, on this workshop are not uh, computer experts, we're already immersed in using these tools. Next slide. Uh, the topics I'd like to cover today are listed here. 
And I'm going to go ahead and skip through the, the first uh, brief definition since the previous speaker did such a great job with that. But I'm going to address black box worries, establishing ground truth, granularity of data analysis. Uh, can you go back to the one slide? Um, go backwards. Anyway, um, granularity of data, governance, and goals. Okay, next slide. And we can skip this, although we could linger for a second. Um, I'm a visual person, and so I think this captures the definitions and the advancements that computer science is undergoing here. Okay, next slide. So black box fears. Much has been written about this, and I think it's important for all of us to acknowledge that these fears exist. Next slide. I think a lot of our fears stem from the magnitude and speed of which changes in computing power um, that have occurred over a relatively short period of time. Next slide. So although we have fears and hesitancies, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning is already being applied fairly widely in the healthcare setting. My opinion is that we should carefully and systematically approach the possibilities of using AI machine learning for image analysis support in MASH clinical trials. Next slide. So in summary, having black box fears is a weakness and not moving forward to try to improve our understanding and experience with AI machine learning um, is a weakness. Okay, next slide. Establishing ground truth in, in computer image analysis. Many of you may be familiar with this famous algorithm that was built to use image analysis to distinguish wolves from huskies. This image analysis program worked well. Next slide. As seen here, only two of the 10 images were incorrectly classified. However, detailed dissection of the functionality of the algorithm revealed that this methodology was based in classification, next slide, on the background snow and was not analyzing any individual features of the animals themselves. I don't believe any of us would like for this type of scenario to unfold for MASH liver biopsy image analysis. Next slide. Many um, publications have described well-functioning image analysis algorithms for detecting metastatic breast cancer in lymph nodes. A trained pathologist can detect even small foci of metastatic carcinoma within the background of a lymph node, next slide, on routine h &E, such as shown here. However, next slide, many of the best performing systems use simple immunohistochemistry, such as keratin, to unequivocally demarcate tumor to establish ground truth and to train the algorithm based on definitive tumor identification. Next slide. So for establishing ground truth for NAS, as a reminder, um, the NAS is composed of lobular inflammation, steatosis, and ballooning. Next slide. This image shows lobular inflammation. <clears throat> to the human eye, there is likely subjectivity as to how to precisely count the number of foci. Using a machine to support mundane tasks, such as counting foci, could be a huge advantage. Next slide. Furthermore, using computer assistance to drill down to the cellular level to identify, segregate, and quantify individual cell types could also be advantageous. For example, we know that some macrophages are good for anti-inflammatory, the M2 phenotype, 
Some macrophages are bad. The M1 phenotype, bad or pro-inflammatory. Next slide. This uh, proof of concept study was presented at EASL in 2022. We use the phase two aldefermin cohort slides. Next slide. We use immunofluorescence labeling, cell size, and cell shape to sort M1 macrophages from non M1 macrophages. Next slide. Aldefermin significantly reduced the M1 foci or the bad inflammatory foci. Next slide with regard to ballooning. <clears throat> As we have all witnessed, establishing ground truth for ballooning has been challenging. Perhaps we now have an opportunity to use computer-assisted image analysis together with simple immunohistochemistry chemistry tools that have their foundations in translational science. Next slide. Esteemed historic figures such as Frank Mallory and Helmut Dink have elucidated the underlying cellular biologic processes of ballooning. Next slide. From this 2007 paper, more contemporary scientists have demonstrated, as you can see on the left, how simple immunohistochemistry can be used to clearly identify ballooned hepatocytes and Mallory Dink bodies. Next slide. The following year, our um, clinical hepatopathologist colleague, Carolyn Lackner, reproduced the use of keratin for the unequivocal ident identification of ballooning. In 2012, our group further corroborated the utility of keratin to identify balloon hepatocytes in NAFLD. Next slide, as you can see here from our paper. Next slide. Um, furthermore, um, our group has also used other protein expression patterns in immunohistochemistry to tag balloon hepatocytes. I believe computer assisted AI machine learning tools could now be leveraged to facilitate improvements in detailed quantitative analysis of MASH histologic features. Next slide. I think in this context, using AI machine learning tools could, um, in this context, using these tools would be a huge strength. I think letting an opportunity such as this pass us by would be a weakness. Next slide. Regarding granularity of data for image analysis algorithms, which mostly applies to validation processes. This 2020 study was performed by a group of pathologists, not just computer scientists in isolation. Next slide. The aim of the study was to determine the impact of assistance from a deep learning algorithm on classifying liver tumors as hepatocellular carcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma. The pathologists in the study had varying levels of expertise and experience. The tumors were also varied by difficulty level. Some tumors were easy to identify, for example, the, the well-differentiated tumors. Some of the tumors in the study were difficult to classify, for example, poorly differentiated tumors. Next slide. The authors conclude that the aggregate accuracy when including all 11 study pathologists did not improve with AI machine learning assistance. Next slide. But in a subset of pathologists, there was increased accuracy with using AI machine learning assistance. Next slide. This study illustrates important AI machine learning performance differences that vary with pathologist experience levels and case difficulty levels. The authors conclude, while correct model predictions had a significant positive impact on accuracy in the assisted state, incorrect model predictions 
had an equally negative impact on accuracy. The results suggest that pathologists might have relied more heavily on the model's output for difficult cases, finding that inaccurate model predictions can have a strong negative impact even on subspecialty pathologists with expertise, raises concerns about the unintended effects of decision support tools, such as, quote, automation bias. Next slide. So in, in summary, specifically with regard to algorithm functionality and validation, analyzing the data in granular detail would be a strength. Not doing so, would be dangerous and a weakness. Next slide. Governance. The issue of artificial intelligence machine learning regulation commonly makes headlines in major news outlets. Next slide. Many of the top industry executives themselves are warning us that as AI machine learning becomes increasingly powerful, tighter governance is needed. Next slide. <clears throat> More specifically, in the pathology space, there are several publications available. Next slide. This paper from 2021 stresses the importance of scientific integrity, transparency, and analytical validity. Next slide. And then again, go one more slide. The authors con uh, continue that AI machine learning developers, validators, and implementers should establish formal oversight mechanisms. Next slide. So as we consider moving into AI machine learning space for MASH, liver biopsy scoring, establishing strong governance policies would be a strength. Ignoring this would be a weakness. Next slide. For our goals, I assume that our simple goal is to advance the utility of liver biopsy scoring for MASH clinical trials. Would this new era of digital pathology, AI machine learning, be opening an opportunity to integrate multidimensional parameters such as radiographic data and omics data together with histology data. Next slide. <clears throat> I sometimes wonder if the non-tumor liver field is a little behind many of our oncologic peers. Perhaps we could collectively take steps to advance tissue-based ba methods for MASH clinical trials. Next slide. Finally, I would just like to point out and remind everyone that in 2011, multiple liver societies, societies decided that in specific radiographic scenarios, in the setting of cirrhosis, liver biopsies were no longer required for mass lesion diagnosis. More recently, this topic has been greatly debated Next slide. In the 2018 EASL clinical practice guidelines, next line, the guidelines have stated several centers have introduced a more active biopsy strategy in order to address different trial and experimental target, sorry, treatment options, especially for systemic therapies. Potential complications of liver biopsy are rare and manageable and do not justify abstaining from diagnostic biopsy. Broader availability of liver biopsy and HCC has the potential to provide suitable patients access to more clinical trials, enlarging the treatment options and supporting research measures expected to improve the therapeutic situation in liver cancer in the future. Next slide. Okay, we're, we're one behind, sorry. Okay, next. Um, in conclusion, um, I think 
an ultimate goal for us should be to continue using liver biopsies and integrate more data into our um, histologic foundations. Next slide. In conclusion, to make progress in the AI machine learning MASH arena, I think we need to put governance in the center. We need to have, as a foundation, unequivocal ground truths. We must understand on a granular level all of the details from validation efforts. Next slide. This will propel us forward, I think, for advancements in AI machine learning, which should always facilitate human learning that should be based on scientific advancements and, and understanding uh, the biological relevance. And I think maybe these factors together could help us reach our goals. Thank you. Thank you so much for those wonderful presentations. Um, just uh, <clears throat> welcome back, everyone. Um, Dr. Prakash Jha will be the co-moderator for this afternoon's session. Uh, Dr. Jha is a medical officer in the Division of Molecular Genetics and Pathology, and he's responsible for a review of uh, molecular genetics and pathology in vitro diagnostics, companion diagnostics in the Centers for Disease Devices and Radiologic Health. Dr. Jha is a pathologist with dual fellowships in GI liver and soft tissue bone from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. As a reminder, the primary focus of the workshop is on non-serotic NASH-MASH um, with advanced fibrosis, stage two, stage three liver fibrosis. And we're especially interested to hear from the pathology and the AI machine learning experts on potential methods in which histopathology assessment may be optimized for this purpose. So we will allow each panelist that has not given a talk uh, about three to five minutes to introduce themselves and present their initial thoughts and perspectives. And then we'll follow this up with a Q&A panel uh, discussions. Uh, for our panel members, please limit responses to questions to about one to two minutes and raise your hand to respond. Um, when I call your name, please introduce yourself uh, and provide your initial thoughts and perspectives. Dr. David Kleiner. I am Dave Kleiner. I. Uh was uh, one of the speakers this morning so i was introduced then if you saw me but i am a pathologist at the national cancer institute uh, but i've been involved in um, the evaluation and, and research in liver disease for my basically my entire career and i'm one of the pathologists in the national clinical research network and have lots of publications in the area of evaluating liver biopsies and clinical trial situations and other other situations. Um, I guess, you know, from the standpoint of uh, some of the things, the topic for this particular discussion, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and methods for evaluating histology, um, I, I have two things, and, and I'm glad that Cindy brought this up because I think that this issue of ground truth is, is a mushy one, and I readily admit this, even though I have to do this kind of on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, for some features uh, like steatosis and and uh, uh, fibrosis, we, we have pretty good methods for figuring out what is a vacuole of, of fat and what is a collagen fiber. Um, we have histochemical methods and uh, autofluorescence of collagen to assess fibrosis. Um, optical clarity and shape of the vacuole for the most part gets us to steatosis, but ballooning and inflammation, um, there are both increased observer issues has been discussed for identification of sort of limits around what ballooning is and what the threshold should be. And in terms of inflammation, you know, while this, the counting of foci and, and that sort of assessment is, is probably fine for a human observer, it's really probably not the best thing if we're going to start being a little bit more rigorous and quantitative about inflammation. And so, so I really appreciate Cindy's um, bringing up other approaches to getting at that ground truth and immunohistochemistry. Um, and there are a lot of robust uh, 
especially with respect to inflammation, a lot of robust, robust methods uh, to identify inflammatory cells in liver biopsies. And it would be great if we could leverage those things to get us to that, to, to a better um, accuracy and quantification of, of those features. Um, my other concern wasn't really raised, but I've raised it in other forums, and, and that's understanding how sensitive any of these methods are to all of the pre-analytic variables from, you know, that sort of the the way that the biopsy is obtained and sort of the, the quality of the piece of tissue that comes to the laboratory, to fixation time, to section thickness, sectioning artifacts, um, stain quality, well, all of these things that go to create the image and, and maybe even the platform that the slide is imaged on, how do all of these things affect the outcome? And, you know, that's, so that's even before we get to the sort of data analysis piece of the actual artificial intelligence. But I think, you know, given given what I see as a pathologist day to day coming coming out, and I know how these things affect my ability to score or va evaluate um, liver biopsies, I can't imagine that they don't have some effect on our on our ability to quantify uh, things in artificial intelligence. And I think that it's really important as we develop these tools for digital pathology, um, either as adjunctive tools or as standalones, that we understand as pathologists what we need to do to, to get the best sample into the image so that things can happen appropriately. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kleiner. Uh, Dr. Bailing? I don't have anything to add to what David said. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kathy Wack. Hi, I'm Katie Wack. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you guys very much for inviting me to participate. Uh, this has been so interesting. Um, I'm Katie Wack, and I'm Vice President at Path AI of Clinical Development Strategy and have led uh, regulatory and clin ops over the years across all of our oncology and non-oncology programs, but very heavily in NASH. Um, I also serve on the board of the Digital Pathology Association and have been sort of in the digital pathology field for a long time. Uh, my PhD is in cell biology and molecular biology, uh, as well as having a master's in liver tissue engineering and long time um, researcher of liver regeneration as well, focusing on sinusoidal endothelial cells and stellate cells. Um, I lead our AIM NASH. Some of you may have heard of AIM NASH, our drug development tool program, uh, along with its validation. And we've been collaborating with FDA and EMA in the biomarker qualification program now for a few years. Um, our main, our high level mission at Path AI is to improve patient outcomes with AI powered pathology. Uh, we do this from translational research and uh, discovery of new biomarkers as well as uh, developing clinical trial algorithms for, for different contexts of use and uh, diagnostics. In collaboration uh, with our lab down in Memphis, we have a diagnostic uh, pathology lab, as well as um, a clinical trial lab down there. And so in addition to developing these AI tools with pathologists, we've We've just been learning, we've been providing primary pathology reads via our digital pathology platform and have learned so much about the challenges, um, you know, firsthand in the whole from receiving biopsies to reporting out inclusion criteria and uh, follow up time point scoring. Um, and what we really aim to do is we feel that there's immediate and long term needs. I think we've been discussing both of these today and will tomorrow. Um, across uh, all disease drivers and fibro fibrosis progression and regression. And so we aim to address the immediate need with the current uh, recommended endpoints. Um, I think histology is always labeled as the problem, but I think that perhaps we should be a little bit more specific. Uh, perhaps it's the lack of standardization that we've been talking about or the identification and quantification of features um, that could be the challenge and for which we have many uh, AI based, but also as um, 
as has been discussed, just image analysis tools at our disposal for pathologists uh, so that we can better capture change over time, um, as well as just enroll consistent populations across drug candidates across phases. Um, and then as far as uh, providing a platform, we have validated our whole site imaging platform specifically for NASH in just establishing an equivalence, first of all, between glass and digital uh, evaluations of NASH and CRN based on the CRN scoring system, um, which also just allows for these consensus reads that we've been talking about uh, and independent reads in parallel in addition to that. Um, so after validating the platform, we've validated our uh, our AIM NASH algorithm, and this is both uh, AV and CV over 1,400 biopsies. And what we're really doing there is sort of similar to what you would need to do with an end-to-end -end assay. Um, so we're looking at the accuracy and the reproducibility, and we're comparing, um, talking about the ground truth and the variability, we're comparing to an independent consensus ground truth and sort of a, a a large number of pathologists so that we can statistically get a representative idea of the performance across multiple clinical trials. And as Dr. Kleiner mentioned, um, a wide variety of pre-analytical factors. Uh, our algorithms return both overlays, sort of identifying artifact that the model is calling out, um, as well as the key histologic features that the model is uh, identifying and the associated scores. And this sort of reduces the whole, the black box aspect that uh, is definitely an important aspect. And so you can see what the model is basing its scoring on. Um, for CV, we've shown that the model, besides being uh, just as or equivalent, equivalently accurate as an expert NASH pathologist, it actually brings an individual pa NASH pathologist closer to that consensus ground truth, which uh, one of the, like I said, one of the key goals is really to standardize the scoring. Um, and we think that this can help to achieve that. And then, of course, it's superior in reproducibility. Um, that's across scans across um, a wide range of, of staining quality, et cetera. And so there's lots of, of published data you can see there with our academic and biopharma partners in testing some of this out, uh, as well as this was presented at ESOL. And we have a preprint out uh, that you can see uh, which describes our validation of our whole site imaging platform. Secondly, we felt it was important to address the long-term needs to develop better histologic biomarkers, possibly less susceptible to um, sampling variability uh, and maybe better predictive biomarkers. And those are quantitative algorithms uh, which we've developed to measure these features directly from the H&E. Um, I think we, were also, we have also talked a lot today about the importance of the relationship between the drivers of the disease and the resulting fibrosis. Uh, and so what we aim to do is to detect individual cell features, architectural features, uh, as well as fibrosis patterns, quantifying various fibrosis patterns in the same um, section. And this is this is sort of a more long term project, though, that can uh, using our precise um, aim Nash uh, with the current staging system as sort of the bridge to the ground truth, we can then move beyond that ground truth. Uh, and start to uh, give pathologists more tools to better characterize things like types of inflammation or the relationship between inflammation um, and paraportal fibrosis, for example. And so that's that's sort of high level what we do, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Wack. Uh, Dr. Dean Tai. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Dean Tai. I'm Chief Scientific Officer, co-founder of Histo Index. Um, I'm an engineer by training, but I work very closely with uh, liver pathologists. In fact, I think I work with Dr. Guy, Dr. Guman, and Dr. Kleiner, Dr. Bailing over the last few years. So uh, I have been building algorithms for uh, MESH for the last 10 years. And I just want to share some of my experience and my takeaway from the previous talks. So I think it's very clear that the staging system that described like such as NASH CRM, it was designed to reflect or recall natural history. It was not designed to recall intervention efficacy. It 
and therefore the the, the features such as fibrosis regression was not taken into consideration. But I know the group is actually uh, working on that. Um, so we first reported that in uh, the the septa uh, system that that was reported uh, uh, many years back, talking about the regressive septa, progressive septa. So that for me the takeaway is uh, collagen. It was mentioned again. Collagen is not about just the total amount. It's about where the collagen are, and also about what kind of collagen resolution uh, is during these trials. So, so for us, uh, in order to 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 provide a solution as an engineer, that's basically uh, what I do. So I, I I look at this as two limitations. So first of all, you need to understand the standing nature, okay? Because we're talking about quantification. So uh, standing was designed to identify architectures for pathologists. It was not designed for AI to do fine quantification. So when we say we use AI to develop uh, one point, stage 1.2 or 2.8, uh, that was based on a big assumption that the quantification is accurate. Okay, so, so uh, that means for us, the validation is very important. Okay, give one example. Uh, the the ballooning work we did with all the, the that was highlighted many times by Dr. Patrick and Dr. Kai. The objective of that paper is really to establish the ground truth for ballooning. And what in what we did in that paper is that we take out every single balloon cell that was identified and use that to build ground truth. So in a similar work we published with Dr. Gumman, we tried to build a septa and nodule with AI. So in that study, every single septum and every single nodule was identified and independently validated like a, a, with a separate cohort, uh, like Dr. Petri suggested. So we managed to get an accuracy of reproducing, uh, uh, detecting septa and nodule over 90%. That's with Dr. Gumman. So the, the 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 level of validation needed is very different from what we see in most of the pathology papers, where we use inter observer inter uh, and intra observer kappa values. So that's one thing I what we learned that we we need to yes I, I we I, we I echo and agree with Dr. Patrick's uh, need for standard and standard set and also the validation. I think we just need to also take look at it at the different level. We cannot use the, the level of standard uh, and also the level of validation used for pathologists on a categorical system. We need to use a system that's designed for AI, looking at, at a quantification system. So that's uh, my um, what, uh, my first point. One more comment I would like to make, make is that the The sorry, just give me one minute. I took some notes just to make sure I get it. So one more thing I, I get is that the how much of change is important. You know, we know is a one stage change for uh, categorical system, but for quantitative assessment, let's say, is it a five percent of the perisinusoidal fibrosis change? Is that relevant? So that's actually something we we are working on, and that's something I think as a group we need we need to, uh, to work towards too. So on the basis of a very good standard and quantification, we need to link all these small changes, uh, fine changes to long term clinical outcome. So in ESO uh, earlier this year, we published some preliminary data linking these fine changes to long term outcome, such as uh, decompensation and all cause mortality. So I think uh, in, in short, I think this is a very exciting time. We have some preliminary data, but it's more importantly, we have uh, worked together to establish this uh, data accurately and with good governance. So, because right now the, the worry is that uh, without governance, the data is not complete. So a lot of work might be wasted. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tai. Um... So I'd like to start off with a question. I think that as a, by training, I'm a, I'm a clinical hepatologist. I am not a pathologist. So, but I wanted to touch on something maybe 
that was alluded to or discussed both in the previous session and to a certain extent in this session, which is this concept of recognition um, or evaluation of sort of more subtle or modest changes that don't necessarily uh, meet criteria for NASH resolution or fibrosis reversal. And we sort of acknowledge um, that based on AI assessments, you may be able to sort of quantify these more subtle changes. So a 5% change or a change in location of fibrosis, et cetera. I guess the, the, the clinical question, and, and I think uh, Dr. Tai touched on this, I guess, a little bit is, you know, do we have any data, whether it's based on AI data or non-AI data, that there is that these sort of more subtle differences in fibrosis, for example, will have any clinical impact or clinical outcomes that don't meet the threshold for one stage of fibrosis and sort of the a similar question for effects on NAS. So do we have any data that demonstrates the clinical impact or clinical outcomes of small changes in inflammation or ballooning or steatosis NAS scores that are an improvement but don't necessarily meet the threshold for NASH resolution? Um, and so I think I I want to open it up for obviously everyone on the on the on the panel um to sort of provide your perspectives thank you dr tai i think you had your hand up first yes thank you so yes actually uh in the recent data we presented in ESO, um we show that um the changes collagen percentage in the central vein and pericentral area has a stronger correlation to clinical outcome than the collagen in portal, tread, and periportal area. Okay, so this, I think, I, I, I when I share this data with, with many people, to them, it's not really a surprising finding, but it is the very first time we had data uh, showing that. I think what we need now is a, another independent cohort to validate this. But as uh, as it is, this is uh, very exciting for us. Dr. Goodman, I think you had your physical hand up, or did I misinterpret? You're on mute. Sorry. Dr. Goodman, you're on mute still. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Thank yeah. you. So, you know, the real problem is since we haven't had a positive study with a drug that really worked, you don't have any data to say how much is needed to to have a positive result. Um, some of the sponsors have published their results with, uh, well, the, the, for example, the, the uh, changes that uh, correlate with um, non-invasive tests with spontaneous changes in uh, the various uh, histologic parameters, right? So this is like placebo effect. So the placebo effect, when you have a placebo effect, you can show that there's a change in usually in all of these other things as well, where it improves. There's a lot of spontaneous improvement, believe it or not, in NASH. Everybody this morning was talking about how it inexorably leads on to cirrhosis. That's That's not true. A lot of the patients are regressing most of the time. You see that in some of the uh, screening biopsies where they have the very thin septa showing regression. And uh, we, we, we've done uh, morphometry using, uh, you know, the serious red staining and quantification of collagen in some of the uh, studies where there was absolutely no effect of the uh, of the, of the active drug on any of the uh, parameters that were studied. And actually the majority of patients are actually are regressing most, much of the time. I think there's probably a period during which something happens and there's a sudden increase in, in fibrosis and then they spend the rest of the time healing, getting better. And then you see a lot of biopsies that have spontaneous regression if you measure the fibrosis quantitatively, which is what we've been doing now for quite a while. Now, in viral hepatitis, it's different, right? We did a lot of studies on uh, hepatitis C in patients who failed to respond to interferon. Uh, there were there was, uh, four, four trials that uh, I worked on, and we did morphometry in those patients 
of those, even after they have advanced cirrhosis, it gets worse. They have continue to have increases in collagen in probably 80%. And the other 20% where it decreased, my, my assumption was that was sampling variability, although maybe some of them really were decreasing. With NASH, it's totally different. The, the majority of patients, no matter how much fibrosis they have, are regressing most of the time. Uh, how much is significant? I, I, I sort of cut it at, at 10. I figured like if they, if they stayed within 10% of the amount of collagen they had compared to the baseline, that, that's probably not a real change. So if you look at that, patients in the um, um, stage three studies, the, the bridging fibrosis studies from Gilead, it was about, um, I believe they got, it, was, it, was, it was like two thirds of the patients had less collagen in the, in the follow-up biopsy. With the cirrhotic studies, there's like Stellar 4, it was uh, maybe about, 50, uh, about 30% 30, 30 had less collagen than, the, than, than to start with, which is very different from viral hepatitis where you've got a virus there. And these are patients who did not respond. So they had active viral disease and they were continuing to get worse. Uh, nobody knows what the driver of NASH is. There must be something in, and maybe it has nothing to do with the fatty liver disease. I keep wondering, could it be their diabetes and vascular disease that's causing the progression of fibrosis? Maybe it has nothing to do with fat and ballooning. I mean, you know, nobody's actually investigated that as far as I know. So you, as a remember, you heard it here first. Thank you, Dr. Goodman. And I think you, you know, some of your comments brought up the point I think Dr. Friedman had brought up in the previous session that we should think of this as a chronic inflammatory disease. And as with most chronic inflammatory disease, you'll have response rates on the order of 20 or 30 percent, right? So if you look at IBD trials, you have placebo response rates on the order of 20 or 30 percent. So maybe it's not surprising that we see some of these same patterns in terms of fibrosis regression and placebo arms if it is a waxing and waning chronic inflammatory disease in that same manner. Um, thank you. Dr. Dr. Wack, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, um, I think you you mentioned the relationship between the, the current stage change endpoints and these quantitative, and we were talking earlier about magnitude. Um, I think there's there's been a lot of data demonstrated that you know, AI-based methods can capture quantitative change of these various features and that there can be a statistical uh, difference between placebo and uh, a drug candidate. I think as to whether how much um, will predict clinical benefit, I, I'm not sure we are there yet. Uh, but I have actually seen some of the data presented at easels that continues to support um, the the stage change and NASH resolution as being predictive of that clinical benefit. It's just the question is, um, could there be less? And especially in some of these phase two trials, uh, you know, with shorter time periods, are we being too aggressive with some of these endpoints? And I think the data remains to be seen. And then the relationship between those and the uh, the current uh, scoring system, well, we need a precise method of comparing to the current scoring system. So I think um, it's going to be needed either way to provide that bridge beyond. Any, um, just wanted to open it up for the rest of the panel. Dr. Kai or Kleiner. Dr. Bailing, anybody else? Dr. Patrick? Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ja, if you want to take um, some of the next questions, thank sure. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for participating in the, in the chat. My next question is, what limitation must be overcome to validate these tools? And... Uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Kleiner said about the pre-analytic portion of it. Uh, are there any other um, other limitations which we have to factor in? Anyone? Oh, Nick. Uh, okay, I'll start off. I mean, I think as was already mentioned. There's challenges around what is the reference and truth for the, so there's two different types of assessment. One is sort of what we call the standalone. So how does the algorithm work by itself? 
Um, and if that's all that's going to be implemented in clinical practice, and that may be all that's needed, but especially when you're integrating or utilization by the clinician, there's a second part, which is what is the clinical utility of these tools? Um, so we can tell that the tool works. It can determine a feature. It can measure that feature maybe very well, but we don't necessarily know that clinical impact of that tool. And so those are two different challenges in how you go about assessing those. Um, and both of those have to be performed. The, the precursor is really, can we make these measurements and how well can we make these measurements? Um, and, and, and beyond sort of the analytical side of this, we get into this variability in the reference. What is the reference? How do we count, say, all the cells on an image or all the ballooning cells? What is the real reference there? How do we do that? That That's a big challenge. And AI clearly has a big advantage in the sense it can be systematic in how it approaches those. But we really need to understand how do we measure that? How do we determine that we're effective in those in that sort of standalone sense? And then the second part would be, if you're doing that and you're making those measurements, what's the clinical value of those measurements? What types of studies? How do we set those up? Do we need the integration into the drug trials? How do we do that in order to get better data to, to support that clinical benefit? So I think there's lots of challenges around um, assessing these and understanding their performance. Thank you. Dr. Guy? Um, yeah, I have an interest in... Um you know, again, like granularity of how the algorithms will interface with pathologists and how pathologists can have control over the quantitative output. For example, if I disagree on the grade of cetosis, I think that the algorithm, that like that needs to be established and the algorithm shouldn't have the like authority to outweigh me, especially I know some of the algorithms will not let the human make a change unless it's a two degree change. So that would be me looking at the slide and like going, yeah, like I think there's some ballooning here, but the algorithm is giving it, you know, a score of two. So I would have to go all the way to zero before the algorithm would before I would be able to override the algorithm. So I think small things like that, we need to all understand as a group exactly how the algorithms are performing and that humans must understand what the out, how the output is generated, again, on a granular level. Thank you. Dr. Bell? Hi, I apologize for my lapse earlier. I was having a technical problem and just got into the call. Um, I was introduced earlier and I'm one of the liver pathologists work with most of you for on various um, NASH projects. And I have two comments regarding what would it take to get this um, validated and working. And I think that we cannot underestimate the um, pre-analytic issues with the tissue that is being used both for pathology analysis as well as for the image analysis and AI programs. I think that um, standardization of that pre-analytic phase um, will go a long way because neither we nor a uh, machine can really read poor quality slides or poorly stained slides. So I think some of these newer methods where we can do virtual staining may help, but I think the pre-analytic phase is something we need to pay attention to. And then the second thing, um, I completely agree with Cindy on the whole issue of transparency and how the algorithm is, um, is acquiring its usefulness, I guess. Um, you know, I think some of the issue with NASH features is that there's a huge biologic variation, as we can see from that, the balloon paper, which has been, I think, cited three times today. Um, there's a huge variation in biologic features. And then there's also the interpretive aspect of the taking the experience and the knowledge of the pathologist who is integrating all of the information in the biopsy into interpretation of a single cell sometimes um, and putting that whole intellectual component into their identification of a cell. And so I think those are two things that need to both the interpretive part, acknowledging that there's this variation in biologic spectrum of findings, and then the pre-analytic phase are the two most important things to me. Dr. Ty. Hi, thank you. So uh, well, I would like to echo that and, and even give an example. So when we did the, our 
AI performance, right? Actually, we agree with pathologists, I would say 80, 90% of the time. It's always that 10, 20% where we have a disagreement. And then we spend time really looking to understand what's happening. I think that happens among pathologists too. Just to give one example, when I when I was working with Dr. Gumer on the SEPTA identification, you know, the question we found between AI and Dr. Gumer is, is something really trivial and yet very important. So what happens is that when we have like a two separate two separate SEPTA join into a portal track, right? So, but the AI interpret as a should I interpret as a one long SEPTA or should I divide it into two or multiple SEPTA? So, so a lot of this to me is a definition issue. Okay, so actually, what I'm trying to say is working with the pathologist to redefine definitions for AI is important because as of for now, definitions are made for pathologists. They are not made for AI, including all these regression features. Uh, they are very new to, to, to people like the experts here, and then along how, how AI will be able to know that if we want to do supervised training. So for me, I think the definition for AI is important. It's one cru crucial limitation we need to overcome. Ready? You are muted. There we go. Um, definitely echoing all of those things, the pre-analytical factors and, and even, um, you know, scanner to scanner differences, which is a, a, a large thing that the DPA is working on with FDA and sort of trying to standardize across scanners uh, and file formats. Um, as far as the pathologist goes, I think the challenge is, is difficult because alongside the lack of standardization of, for example, what ballooning is, you're going to get different agreements, like we said, with different pathologists. Um, so how to how to tackle the lack the, to be able to standardize across pathologists with an AI tool um, for the specific use case of detecting change over time, so that we can have uh, one metric that sort of standardizes across phases across drug assets and across different pathologist users, I think is a huge challenge and one that we're all trying to tackle um, and can only be achieved, I think, with AI and, and uh, pathologists together. Anybody else? I think Dr. Kleiner has his hand up. Oh, Dr. Kleiner. Yeah, yeah just, just a quick comment. I, I guess what would be um, important and just following on um, Katie's comment, I, for me, the the threshold as an individual pathologist looking at a you know a heat map or something that an AI tool might generate, for me, what would be important would be to understand sort of where it draws the lines and and what its what its limitations on recognition of things is. I mean, I I know that there are limitations in, for example, recognizing steatotic vacuoles. So you, so you run into problems with really small vacuoles. Maybe they don't matter. We don't know. Um, you might run into problems with, with vacuoles touching each other or merging. Depends on the algorithm that you use. Maybe we've solved all of those problems. But what I need to know as, as the pathologist is, okay, so how is the computer using that information to, to draw its lines? I can be flexible about, you know, how I interpret something. If I understand, you know, sort of as, as the the viewer, you know, where does it get its where does it get its numbers from? And you know, if 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 it's um, for for me, for example, for ballooning, it matters that how sort of bad the individual cells are if they're, you know three or four times the, the size of a normal cell and there are lots of them, you know, and they've got big Mallory bodies, that's, that's for me, a very severe situation. And it's different from the situation where you might have numerically maybe more smaller cells that don't have Mallory bodies in them that are a little bit more borderline in their quality. Um, but if the machine is sort of identifying all of those equally, then to me, it's I at least I understand where it's coming from, um, 
and maybe maybe that can be worked on or tweaked or correlated with clinical data or something to, to get us farther. But you know, in terms of validating it as a pathologist tool to use, um, I, I I kind of have personally I need a, a bit of a deeper understanding of of how it how it's identifying those areas and what what sort of the pitfalls and limitations are. Um, and you know, you I I mean I see the abstracts that are presented and the papers that are published, and you know they you. I've written pathology papers too. You show your good stuff, right? So you show the show the show the best stuff. I don't want to see just the best stuff. I want to see the worst stuff too, because I, you know, if I'm going to use such a tool in my practice, I, I need to know, you know, what its fail points are as well as where it's really strong. So, you know, I guess for me to get to that final step where this is incorporated in pathology practice, I I need to know when I can depend on it and when I should, you know, depend on my training and experience. I think uh, we'll move to the next question. And this question is that there are, diff there are going, there are already different platforms, AI platforms, there's different technology. Are there significant differences and how we have to uh, validate it so that they can come to the same con conclusion during uh, assessment in NASH. Katie? Yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. I mean, I, I think they are all different. I think, you know, some of them are asking very different questions. And as we talked about for biomarker qualification, it really depends on the context of use. Is it diagnostic or is it predictive? And so I, I don't think there's a one size fits all uh, answer to that. However, I think we we could come up with a guidance probably uh, collectively for various contexts of use. Um, which is very similar, I think, to what you would expect with an, an assay, for example. Um, but I, I definitely think that it's possible to come up with a sort of a standard recommendation depending on the context of use. But we, you know, Dean and I are doing somewhat different things or answering different questions as well. So there are going to be differences in our validation design. Nick? Yeah, I, I mean, I would just add, I mean, there are going to be differences, even for the exact same clinical application or context of use. If they're different algorithms trained with different data, you know, potentially with some variations in the referencing process, there are going to be differences. And I, I think it's a huge challenge to try to address Dr. Kleiner's sort of perspective, which I completely agree with. How do we make sure we understand what the AI is doing? Um, and the more you get more of these devices, the more the lifespan of a device is short, where it's evolving every six months or a year it will become virtually impossible to keep up with all the variations and modifications overall. So the question I think is, is there ability to produce tools that are consistent over longer periods of time, but may not perform quite as well, but then allow more of an ability to understand the failure modes and how they may work a little bit more versus this ever evolving, which we see in AI, new development, here's a new result. It's better, but much more difficult to keep up with these. And I think that's going to be a huge challenge um, you know, do you want to change companies and now all of a sudden you have a new application, you have to relearn it over again. These are all really important considerations when you try to implement this clinically and how this is going to work. Dr. Tai. Hi, thank you. So I would like to, uh, well, I agree up there. I would like to answer that in another uh, angle. So I think we understand that they are supervised and unsupervised uh, AI and also uh, not machine learning based and deep learning based. Okay, so so I think uh, what we did uh, with Dr. Kleiner and with everyone on a ballooning paper is really about trying to get the the best reference, but at the same time we understand what's the limitation of the reference. So that's what we mean by knowledge based. Okay, so the tool AI in this case it does not just answer our question, it helps us to, to, to understand, to investigate. So it's not, it turns out the question we first asked is irrelevant or not 
enough. So I think what I'm trying to say is at different phase of the drug development, you, you will want to use AI differently. As an engineer, we use the box when we try to reproduce something that we are very confident about what it's trying to achieve. Like the example, like Dr. Guy show, you know, identify whether it's a, a, a wolf or a dog, right? So we, we have, as a human, we're very confident of the answer. And that's where the deep learning comes in. And then again, then human is very confident by looking at the data. So I think my response to that is that, uh, for the, especially for the, the drug developers, it really depends on uh, at what stage you you are in your drug development phase. So what kind of data you need to to better plan for your studies. Anybody else? If not, I'll ask a uh, uh, personal favorite question of mine, which is, can you can anybody has seen a data to reassure us that the glass slide that is read under a microscope and the digital slide, which is run under uh, on the computer screen, will give the same result? Uh, yeah. uh, can I? Yes. Yeah, sure. yeah. So uh, we did a, a study. Uh, it's, it's not a big study. It's a 40 patient study. Okay. So what we did is we have uh, three pathologists reading uh, consensusly on the glass slide. Okay. And then, but this study later on, they did the individual read of the whole slide imaging digital, digital read. And later on, they used that uh, with our AI as a tool. So there's an AI edit read. So basically what we have data is we're comparing the consensus glass read with the individual WSI read. So there, the percentage agreement is about 91%. And later on, when you compare the, the consensus glass read versus the individual WSI with AI read, the percentage agreement is about 92%. So I think to in our study is a very small one, but it's basically indistinguishable, uh, meaning between the glass and with WSI uh, and with the uh, glass. But just to bear in mind, this group uh, has been has a, been working together for quite some time because the inter in, intra inter pathologist car is on a high end of about 085 so this is a group of pathologists who has been working very closely. So there's it's limitation to the study, but it's the the kind of pilot study we have. And I believe Katie has more data to share. Thanks. Um, yeah, to to echo that, we recently presented at uh, the Liver Forum, at Paris Nash, some of our results. Um, I, we had upwards of almost 200 biopsies just to power against the endpoint because the cat validation of 60 is really not sufficient when we are talking about uh, scoring and not just categorical diagnosis, but scoring and considering the variability uh, intra and inter. So we had an independent ground truth of, of three, and we compared individual, multiple individual pathologist reads glass to ground truth, digital to ground, ground truth. Uh, we looked at inclusion criteria as well as just uh, overall evaluation of diagnosis of NASH, not NASH, and any additional findings that you may see in a screening population or during the trial, as well as looking at individual scores for each histologic component and showed uh, no difference between glass and digital compared to ground truth across all pathologists for any component. Um, and so we're hoping uh, we can use this evidence now to bridge and use these platforms to then provide AI tools uh, on top of that. Um, so, yes. Any of the pathologists, are they ready to leave the microscope and look at the screen and read? David? 
for for us it's just a sort of a workflow issue i mean you know i know that a number of big academic university hospitals who apparently have money and time and everything to do this are just digitizing everything as it comes off the off the staining machine but um you know in actual fact the nih's or the nci's laboratory pathology is relatively small operation and you know one person down and that really limits us so um and and i don't think we're unique um in in that sense um you know so so to move to digital for even the small applications that we're using it for which is mostly as sort of an adjunct to our molecular pathology operation um we're not using it for the most part for primary diagnosis uh is is a challenge just because you know it's an extra step you need somebody to to load the machine you, you know maybe someday there will be situations where where things can come right off the stainer cover slipper right into the machine maybe these exist already and you just have to buy them but we don't have them and so it's it's still still a challenge and and i there are other challenges too to this operation but um for right now for us glass is quick digital pathology is not so you know and it it's costs more so so that's that's our conundrum right now um you know that i think if in the future these ai tools become more pervasive and have maybe applications across multiple areas of pathology that that are have provide clinical benefit um and i can think of a whole bunch but right now we don't we don't have them so maybe someday so i'm finished with my part of the question so george hey, thank you any final thoughts from any of the other pathologists before we conclude dr bailing I do have just one quick comment, and this gets back to Cindy Guy's presentation earlier. So we've been mostly talking about um, image analysis and artificial intelligence, but I do want to make the point, which I think Cindy made, that there are a whole host of new ways or additional ways that we can um, get information from biopsies, including immunohistochemistry, image analysis, and molecular methods. And so really the biopsy is kind of a critical set of bioinformation and the current scoring systems that we used is really only a very small portion of information that we can get out of a biopsy. And so I'd really like to make the point that um, that at this point, we don't even know the limitations of what kind of information we can get out of a biopsy. There's a lot more to be known and used and have it used for. Thank you, Dr. Bailing. And thank you everyone for, for your uh, insightful thoughts and contributions to this session. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Frank Anania next, our division director, our acting uh, division director uh, for the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition. Thank you again. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thanks, George. I'm Frank Anania, the acting director of the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition here at the FDA. I want to take this opportunity to thank the speakers for their outstanding presentations and the discussants and moderators who provided such a rich discussion for all that we have heard today in preparation for tomorrow's uh, talks on imaging and serological biomarkers to consider these for clinical investigations of metabolic associated steatohepatitis or MASH. However, before we adjourn this evening and in preparation for tomorrow, I'd like to take a 30,000 foot recap of all that we have learned today. We started the day with many of my colleagues coming forward to discuss the statutory requirements for biomarkers validation, the distinction between analytical and clinical validation. And then we heard from Dr. Stein discussing intermediate or candidate surrogate endpoints, validated surrogate endpoints, and surrogate endpoints likely to predict clinical benefit. I think that Dr. Heller's talk uh, perhaps gave me the most important aspect of what we're facing in the field and why 
we decided to convene this workshop, and that is tension. So on the one hand, we at FDA and the division are concerned with benefit risk analysis of any products that come before us, specifically here for the treatment of MASH. We understand the conundrum that investigators and our stakeholders face in handling the issue of liver biopsy and histology as a surrogate endpoint likely predict benefit. However, we heard from my colleagues in the basic science arena about the importance of the resolution of fibrosis and how steohepatitis appears to be along the causal pathway. There was some consideration that maybe two drugs would be required to treat this condition. And perhaps treatment like in other chronic inflammatory diseases, as Dr. Friedman pointed out, will likely be have to take lifelong. But the tension exists that as Dr. Levin pointed out, that the surrogate endpoints always have a degree of uncertainty. And therefore, as Dr. Heller nicely put it, there is going to be a tension between what we know and what we don't know. I want to also point out that in this particular workshop, we elected not to have the patient voice be brought forth to the audience and our stakeholders. And the reason for that is because we wanted to have the most and the best science available so that we could better be better informed about the strengths and weaknesses, the gaps of knowledge for the development of other surrogate endpoints likely to predict clinical benefit in MASH. However, uh, in listening to the conversations today about artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think one of the questions we would have to ask ourselves is whether or not the patients who we hear from our stakeholders, including patient advocacy groups, are not too keen on undergoing liver biopsies repeatedly, would be happier with, for example, the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence because histology would still be part of the requisite. For tomorrow's discussion, in preparation for the understanding of what is available to us, we have to also consider, therefore, the, uh, what we have available and what is safe and what we know and what patients will accept as well as our stakeholders. Finally, I would like to also say that what, I, what we learned today was there are, is some information that in this liver disease is distinctly different from the viral hepatitis, which we have been very successful in treating. A single agent that is targeted is, was relatively easy, in, so to speak, in treatment. That is not the case we heard today with NASH. It is a disease that has many factors, many cellular players, and there are potentially many targets, both good and bad, that play a role in our decision-making for the treatment of MASH. I wish you all a good evening, and I look forward to tomorrow's discussion when we will hear about serological and imaging markers that are being considered in lieu of liver biopsy and histology for clinical trial investigation. On behalf of all of my colleagues, we again thank all of the stakeholders and audience for participating today, and we look forward again to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.